Hello, my name is Frida Afari. I am an Iranian American librarian, writer, and translator, and a member of the Alliance of Middle Eastern and North African Socialists. On behalf of the Global Campaign of Solidarity with the Syrian Revolution and the Alliance of MENA Socialists, I would like to welcome you to this third webinar in a 12 part series on the Syrian Revolution A History from Below. Syria has been at the center of international media in many ways since mid-March 2011, following the start of a popular uprising in the country and its violent repression by the brutal regime of Bashar al-Assad. The Syrian civil war has increasingly transformed over the years into a war involving not only the Assad regime and ISIS and other Islamic fundamentalist groups, assaulting and killing the revolutionaries and progressives, but also involving regional and global imperialist powers such as Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, as well as Russia and the US. In this panel, our speakers will discuss the role of women activists in the popular protest movement that emerged in 2011 and beyond and their involvement in the organization of various forms of popular resistance. At the same time, the various challenges faced by feminists and women activists during the uprising and beyond will be tackled from the repression they faced by different actors to sexist practices they suffered. The Rojava experience in Northern Syria and the role and participation of Kurdish women in this political project is also included in our discussion. Today's panel participants are Razan Ghazawi, Ziva Gorani, and Maria Al Abde. Razan Ghazawi is a Syrian Palestinian scholar activist and a doctoral researcher in gender studies at the University of Sussex. Her thesis focuses on checkpoints, queer incarceration, and imagining a military prison abolitionist future in Syria. Ghazawi was formerly incarcerated by the Syrian state during the uprising. She is the founder of the Syrian feminist archives with the Q and a founder of Karama Bus. She received the Frontline Defender Award in 2012, and her pronouns are she and they. Ziva Gorani is a Kurdish Syrian queer feminist who started her journey as a humanitarian worker soon after the Syrian revolution in 2011. Her Kurdish queer identity, refugee status, and feminist beliefs open her eyes to the value of social activism in the Middle East. Ziva has worked with many international media platforms, including Al Jazeera, National Radio of France, and CBC, to highlight the depth and the resilience of the queer community in the Middle East against multi-layers of discrimination. Maria Al Abde is Executive Director of Women Now for Development, WND. Maria has a PhD in microbiology and a master's degree in project analysis and sustainable development. She joined Women Now for Development in November 2013, and since then, she has helped the growth of the organization, which has become the largest network of women empowerment centers inside Syria and the neighboring countries, and has participated in many campaigns and conferences to communicate the voices of the most vulnerable women to the media and to activists and decision makers. She focuses on Islamic feminism and women's rights in the Middle East and North Africa region. In March of 2016, Maria received the award of feminine success in France and together with Women Now for Development received in May of 2016 the award of delivering lasting change for commitment to justice and dignity from Care International. After a 15 minute introductory presentation by each panelist, 
I will ask a few questions from them and will then take questions from the Facebook audience. You're welcome to submit your questions in the comments section of the Facebook post for this panel at any point uh, during the course of the panel and the discussion. After 45 minutes of discussion, following the presentations, we will conclude this event. And before we turn to the panel, I would just like to remind viewers that the next webinar in this series on Syria history from below is on Wednesday, July 8. It is entitled From Black Lives Matter to Palestine and Syria. And you can see further details in the poster that is being displayed on, on the screen right now. Uh, and then on July 6, you're also invited to a book launch for Yasser Mouni's new book, The Syrian Revolution Between the Politics of Life and the Geopolitics of Death. It will be a dialogue between Yasser Monif and uh, Saad Deh Kordi, who's an Iranian socialist feminist and uh, political scientist. We will have more details about both of these events at the end of the program. Now, let's turn to the panel, beginning with Razan Ghazal. Razan? We cannot hear you, Razan. Oh, um, yeah, I just uh, was just thanking you, Frida, for the introduction. Um, and I want to thank the organizers for organizing this summer school, a uh, very cool summer school. And also I want to thank Joe and you and everyone who has been uh, uh, behind organizing this panel. And I look forward to uh, having this discussion with uh, amazing language speakers. Um, so I really wanted to talk about two things. Um, the first thing is, is um, the life-making worlds um, offered by grassroots feminists in Syria and anti-war feminists in diaspora. And of course, when I like, there's like anti-war feminists, uh, of course, like in, in Syria, but I wanted to focus on those on diaspora because I really wanted to talk about the collaboration between um, uh, 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 the anti-war, uh, maybe I'm just gonna, <laughs> uh, the anti-war feminists in, in, uh, in diaspora and, and the grassroots feminists in Syria, because we often don't hear about this connection. And I do think that today specifically, I think it's, there's an urgent need to talk about uh, transnational uh, uh, and other forms of solidarity between feminists and how can we envision this kind of um, collaboration. And the second thing I want to talk about really is um, uh, uh, what kind of feminism that we envision for the future, uh, is specifically in relation to um, uh, the context today that we're seeing with sanctions um, and with so the economy and the risk of famine in, in Lebanon and Syria. So this is a, this is the kind of two things I wanted to, to talk about, but from really like but going backwards rather than just kind of uh, a really give an analysis of what's of, of today is rather to kind of go backwards and see the legacy of grassroots feminists and the legacy of uh, of, of, of anti-military feminists since 2011 and how can we continue this uh, in our organizing and, uh, and and research and advocacy um, so these two kind of points I want to uh, uh, like they're based on a grassroots organizing that I was part of since 2005 until 2014 when I was exiled. And then um, and the second point I will, I will kind of uh, uh, share with you how the prison experience has also informed my feminism and also how grassroots experience have informed my feminism. Um, and, and this is the kind of two things I wanted to, 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 to to try to cover um, today. Um, so basically, uh, uh, the, the importance of why I want to talk about grassroots feminism is it's often talked about like when we talk about the Swana region is that feminism is, is talked about being associated with enjoyized movement and enjoyization. And I think that this is not 
it is true in Syria uh, uh, recently, uh, but I don't think it's, but I think it's also dangerous to make that claim because it kind of erases other forms of feminism that we have seen before 2011 and, uh, and during 2011, specifically in, in, in relation to anti-military um, and grassroots uh, feminism. So I just wanna kind of give a, an idea what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, of grassroots feminism. So. So since 2011, uh, and we can like we can talk in the Q and A about forms of grassroots uh, feminists before 2011. But I just wanted to be very strategic in my time and talk about specifically um, like the uprising itself. But in in 2011, uh, there are like uh, mutual aid groups that were led by feminists, and they were organized across neighborhoods and towns. Um, and uh, uh, there were also uh, weekly prison visits, uh, also led by feminist lawyers and grassroots feminists. I was part of this uh, group um, in between 2011 and 2012, and we used to make uh, these visits to Adra prison to check on with prisoners, um, to see their needs, and to be like basically kind of a medial point between them and their lawyers uh, 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 who we were in contact with. Um, there's also like a, a, a grassroots um, uh, feminist networks on the ground that were led by queer women uh, and, and kind of more of a, a, a butches and masculine presenting. Uh, and this is important to kind of talk about you know, talk about surveillance in Syria and how it's it's it's, it's gendered and, and how a lot of the women who kind of maneuvered that space accordingly. Uh, uh, so we cannot romanticize it and say like, oh, like women kind of um, were managed to to work uh, 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 freely, but actually there were limitations to that, but they were very much uh, aware of that kind of gendered space that they worked uh, um, to be able to uh, do a lot of work, like for example, smuggling wanted men out of these neighborhoods and passing them off as 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 relatives. And there uh, and there's also like uh, they were they're tr they're most of their work important is to kind of to cr to uh, break the to kind of cross checkpoints and trying to deliver the aid um, uh, uh, across the checkpoints. And I kind of, and I think this is important to talk about is how a lot of these areas in, in Damascus suburbs and, and neighborhoods in Damascus, like for example, Yermouk Camp and Hajar al-Aswad and other areas, they were, they were in, in certain moments, they were um, completely uh, besieged and there were snipers all around. So these, these, these networks managed to deliver aid, they kind of managed to uh, bring in doctors, bring in di medic, uh, 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 nurses to these areas to kind of, um, uh, 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 to help the communities that were trying to be punished, uh, uh, specifically a MOOC camp at that point. Um, so so a, lot of the, a lot of the things that, uh, um, a lot of these work has uh, that I mentioned um, was done by atheists and leftist queer feminists, by butches, by lesbians, by queer femmes, trans and non-binary activists, Alawite feminists, as well as Christians and Druze and Kurdish, Assyrian and Palestinian and Iraqi refugee feminists, all of whom came from a different class and social realities. Um, and this work is very uh, uh, dangerous and risky, and many people who were really um, uh, survived and uh, uh, were uh, uh, survived a lot of violations, um, uh, uh, sexual assaults, um, it's a, and, and a lot of them are, are detained and killed for doing this kind of work. So there's all this kind of the, all these um, forms of work and grassroots organizing has declined because of militarization. And here is where I want to kind of link back to the, uh, the, the, the importance of the anti-military uh, feminists in diaspora specifically. Why in diaspora? Because I wanted to kind of say how much, what is the opportunity for diaspora to actually help the grassroots? What is the opportunity for diaspora to collaborate with the grassroots? And I think this is an area that it's worth uh, exploring specifically today. Day, uh, uh, and I will come back, come, come back to this moment later on in a moment. 
Um, so so this, is al this alone speaks volumes of how anti-military Syrian feminists who, were, um, a, a, who are in exile, like Rima Frehan, who resigned from her position following the, military, the decision of the opposition to militarize the movement, and Muhja Qahaf in diaspora and a few others um, who have warned us, uh, a grassroots feminist, to, uh, uh, from the militarization as early as 2011. Um, personally, I have joined this anti-military feminist movement in Syria, with which is very much a role movement, and we cannot talk about it as a being like a very emerging or like kind of a, you know very well shaped or conceptualized. It's, just, it's a very kind of a, a new and and recent, and also it is a very contested area because. It, 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 a lot of people did not want to hear this, and a lot of people have been uh, uh, bullied and uncensored and, and silenced for doing this kind of work. So it is a. This is when I say that not many people have, you know, dared to be in the front lines about this issue is because of a lot of backlash that have been received um, because of this. And 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 the, the, some of the things that have been talked, like they've been called Assadist or white Syrian or like kind of elitist feminist or that kind of sort of thing, because they were uh, critical of militarization of the uprising. So these forms of life making, life uh, of life making feminism, and this grassroots and anti military should be differentiated from the military feminism in Syria that has been advocating for retribution against quote unquote loyalist towns. And this life-making feminism should be differentiated from the pro-military feminists who called for and supported the Turkish-backed occupation of Afrin. And this, this should also be differentiated from the feminism that actually wants, and we have, we have like seen this and heard this very, very rarely, but it's, I think it's important to, despite uh, this, to, 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 to assert to kind of a, uh, to, to clarify uh, a position is that the, this kind of feminism should also be differentiated um, from a feminism that wants to normalize ties with settler colonial state of Israel. So it is in these critical moments that I think most um, are most uh, more than ever the legacy of anti-military, anti-feminism, and anti-sanctioned uh, feminism that should be followed for the Syrian future. And the second thing I want to talk about uh, and to share with you really uh, is that two uh, uh, is, is something that uh, uh, during the, the detention um, and, the, and the woman that I have I've met in detention that has um, changed a great deal of how I defined revolution, how I defined feminism or, or like a revolutionary feminism and how it's actually changed my way of understanding Syrian future is, is really, uh, uh, is really uh, meeting um, uh, migrant workers who were in, in, like in a, in, a, in a space that is that are neither detained but also neither, that are not released. They were kept in police station in Kafar Suse, and a lot of them um, don't have the resources to survive. So basically, a, a lot of these uh, uh, of migrant workers. Um, they uh, they were not able to leave the country. Their embassies were not able to leave the country, uh, like to help them to leave the country. In 2011 and 12, I've met them twice during uh, both uh, both uh, bo like in, in in during detention because there's a lot of air, like there's a lot of uh, stops that you have to go in detention, and one of them is is Kafar Suse police station. Um, so in both in both. Uh, detentions that I have seen these women and these women um, what happens is that to some of them is that because they run out of money to survive because you need money you need you need food you need it, it's it's not it, it's not a it, they don't have means to survive uh, and some of them stay for months and some of them stay for for one person I've met that she was there for a year um, and 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 what happens is that these uh, women they've been trapped in police in this police station um, because a lot of the people, uh, the police themselves, they have ties with the military, and they and these women, they have been trying to survive by doing sex work. So all of these kind of, like, uh, uh, how 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 the the how the connections between the police and the military um, it, within the authoritarian neoliberal, liberal, neoliberal state, it tells us a lot about other forms of justice and other forms of struggles that have been, that we need to, to, to focus on when we talk about justice, when we talk about um, a, a, a gender justice from the Syrian state. 
especially in the future. And another another thing I wanted to share as well, like that I have met also uh, uh, sex workers in Adra prison who have um, led a strike against their prisoners um, in in protesting the the conditions that they were um, subjected to in prison in, in Adra prison. This is also, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's my first detention or my second, to be honest. I mean, I do have a, 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 a you know, when you remember incident, you don't remember uh, um, at times. But um, a lot of, again, these kind of forms of protest that you, that are not centered in a revolutionary discourse and these forms of struggles that are not centered in the revolutionary discourse and these forms of, 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 of subjects that are disposable by the state and the opposition, um, and they're invisible in the revolutionary discourse is what I think should be our main focus. Um, and um, uh, the most vulnerable, the most invisible, the most that is not talked about because feminists, they want to have alternative future. Feminists, they want to give alternative to what the state has given. Feminists, they want to uh, uh, show how they want, the, how to actually envision a, a, a transformative future, a transformative justice. And I do think, uh, which is, I'm going to end here, uh, my, my, uh, my talk is that uh, I do think that an anti-military and anti-sanction uh, uh, feminism um, that is centered on these subjects that are not talked about uh, by centering labor, by centering class, by centering um, um, ethnicity and and um, and uh, and and sexual orientation in our organizing, in our uh, uh, in, in our organizing and research and advocacy. Um, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Razan. I really appreciate your comments, your presentation. And yes, speaking of Syrian uh, women, uh, 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 we'll get to Kurdish women right now, but Syrian Arab women uh, anti uh, who are anti-militarists and opposed to religious fundamentalism and revolutionaries, um, we still we, we still don't know what happened to Razan Zaytuna and Samir Khalil, who were abducted in uh, 2016 or 2000. I'm sorry, 2014, and uh, and so many others, so many other uh, Syrian women activists who um, have uh, have died in uh, mostly in the prisons of the Assad regime, but also in the prisons of the of the religious fundamentalist uh, groups, uh, and not only ISIS, but other other religious fundamentalist groups. So thank you so much. And now we go to Ziva Gorani. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, couple of minutes to talk about something that is very important and something that is very like a dear close cause in my heart. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for once in my life to be invited for a panel that is not revolved about my trans identity. Um, it's been, a, it's been a struggle in my life to not fall into tokenization. And sometimes even if you try to work hard enough, you fall into that trap. So thank you for that. Uh, but in that that being said, of course, there is going to be a little bit of conversation about what my, you know, like trans identity has affected my course of feminism and how I carry myself as a feminist and how I understand it. So I think, you know, like I will try to personalize it from the perspective and then take you from a journey how that my understanding started developing the same concept, how Rosanna was understand, you know, started from a later point of her life. I'm going to go a little bit early to the point where, um, you know, like recognizing uh, growing up in, in a country like Syria under the Ba'ath regime and under the uh, fascist Arab regime, how I understood my body as a Kurdish person and how I understood the prohibition and the, the limitation of, you know, like what, how I can present myself and how I can be perceived. 
Um, I mean, I learned from like a very young age and get go that like, you know, being Kurdish means that there's a lot of things I cannot um, express in, in public as a child, as a teenager, or as whatever and growing up. But that's, you know, I mean, like, I mean, if we're going to be having a discussion about racism and how it's like, you know, like the, um, how colonialism, uh, you know, has impacted indigenous body in Syria, it's going to be a long conversation. But I want to talk specifically how that experience has really affected, you know, what I mean, like growing up as trans women. Um, and I think, you know, like coming here to Canada and started doing more work freely and having more of a backup. I was able to, you know, like, you know, like to, to resonate with a lot of other queer bodies growing up in the in North America or in the West, how intersectionality really affects your presentation uh, and how the community perceives you. So, I mean, the the fact that I'm trans is very much, it's a, it's a death sentence in Syria anyway. But like when you're trans and Kurdish, you hold that intersectionality as a shame by the Kurdish community that because as Kurdish community we're like trying to to present ourselves in the front of everyone who is like outside of the Kurdish community as we're like you know we're the overachiever the sense of apologetic uh, you know like um, the sense of apology that we have for being that because we're oppressed by this the regime so of course when a body like me comes up on the surface and present themselves as someone who is non-conventional, someone who is not, um, someone who is not, you know, confirming to what gender and what, what, like, you know, what I should be presenting and how I should be carrying myself. So I grew up under that that I'm not only letting myself down or my family down, but I'm letting a whole nation and a Kurdish identity down because of who I am. Of course, like, I mean, that really isolated me, that really put me on the side and the sense of isolation um, and alienation that I felt growing up and tr trying to grow my political beliefs and how I perceive on one, that's one of the downsides of it. But on the other hand, being not, you know, I mean, like drag or like, you know, followers of a lot of the Kurdish parties and how they function in Rojava, for example, it gave me more of a brief to really understand the situation as from someone who's not being invited into it or not welcome into those spaces. Um, I think, you know, like, um, why it was so important for me to talk about this, um, the situation? Because it really, uh, really expresses the situation of what it's like to be a Kurdish woman. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, so, uh, so I'm, like, as I said, like, you know, what it's like to be the reality of being a Kurdish woman in, in Rojava. That same sense of being an apologetic, that same sense of like being completely abducted from every, you know, simple right of view, that still exists. Yes, all Syrian women and what they've been like, you know, like in terms of like, you know, growing up socially, um, and, and growing up socially, how is like, you know, like, you know, they're, 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 they live under the mercy of, you know, what men can give them and how they can carry themselves and all the, the, the you know, like, but, but being a Kurdish woman, it rather takes a lot of dignity layers out of you because you already questioned and you already asked to be an overachiever, something that a lot of intersectional bodies have to do every day, every moment, that we have to be an overachiever. Why, why for me that relates? Um, I remember back in 2017 when this um, queer fighter, uh, you know, Kurdish or uh, Kurdish queer fighters against ISIS, something like that came up. It really, you know, on a personal level, while a lot of Kurdish actually started praising and, and, and people from the, you know, Kurdish queers started praising, of course, those Kurdish queers that, you know, of course, happened to be like, you know, non, uh, non women or not, you know, what, I mean, what, is, what is like that. They understand what what like you know the, the relation of being a queer, queer Kurdish fighter. They kind of have that pride of it, but that aggravated me because it's really kind of like you know, it serves everyone but the Kurdish queers in Syria. And I was saying that like I remember back then actually me and Razan and Razan had a, that article talking about the same conversation that I was mentioning that 
It is very important that we have to mention that the, the rights of the queer community and the LGBTQ community in Syria, and especially when you're Kurdish, it's completely a death sentence. You know, when your family, when your Kurdish family finds out you're a queer person, they're not going to give you, a, they're not going to give you like a break. Because again, as I said in the beginning, when I mentioned, I'm not only disgracing a family, I'm disgracing a whole nation. And it happened in my case when, when I came out publicly as an activist and a trans activist, uh, I felt like a whole community back at home in Rojava felt offended for what I have done. Um, so I felt like, it is very important how we carry ourselves and how we present that to the to to especially for queer diaspora, Kurdish queer diaspora outside, and how we're talking about what does that sound like and how does that how does that impact the lives of the Kurdish queers inside of Syria? Because at the end of the day, we have no protection. We have no one that is back backs us up. I don't have my Kurdish community behind me. I don't have anyone behind me to, to support myself. I didn't have, I mean, at the end of it, even when I started talking loudly about like, you know, what does it mean standing up against those kind of propaganda, I actually also lost a lot of Kurdish friends that they were actually trying to root for Rajav and all of that, which I am, I'm, 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 I'm for the rights of everyone who's trying to fight for their rightful, you know, I mean, like, you know, existence in, in, in that land. However, it shouldn't be, you know, I mean, on the account of using our bodies and women bodies as a propaganda um, to, 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 to kind of polish the image. Um, and, and I think, you know, that also speaks very loudly about the image of women fighters and how that image of women fighter, like, you know, in, in the costume and the, you know, the guns and how they're fighting and the documentary and all of that, it really like, it touches a very special place in my heart. Not that, you know, I mean, I don't have any question in mind that those women are actually really, they're, 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 they're dedicated, they're going for it. They, they don't have any question in mind that they're doing that because they believe in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right to, to, to practice their culture, practice everything. But what aggravates me as a feminist, as someone who's outside of that norm, that women in Syria in general, but Kurdish women specifically speaking, were still living the horrors, for example, of being, you know, like, you know, being killed for, for the simple act of any sexual act that happens, you know, for a woman before, before marriage, were sentenced to death. We are not able to practice a lot of the simplest right of like in our education, of how of how we 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 carry ourselves in the world and who to choose for ourselves to for marriage. We're still very, 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 very even beyond behind a lot of like, you know, like the the, the Syrian woman's narrative in Syria. And there's still a lot of Kurdish feminists like in Syria, they're still fighting to actually at least have simple rights as Syrian Arab women have in home without, you know, I mean, like in, in Syria, which is in itself, it's very little, it's very fought, it's very much, you know, like it, you have to mimic a, a masculine attitude or even a, like a, um, a sex or a patriarchal understanding of what is like, you know, activism is. And then we kind of call ourselves feminists. So, <clears throat> It does. I mean, like as I said, like having that romanticization of what Kurdish fight, woman fighters is, it really kind of like sets a level that a woman, a Kurdish woman, is only valid when she sacrifices her life, when she provides the ultimate sacrifice, which is like you know to go and kill herself and to go beyond the front where we're not talking about the rights of women to be in schools, the rights of Kurdish women to not be killed by their brothers or by their fathers, but the right of Kurdish women to choose for themselves and not to be under the impact of what the family has to decide for themselves. You know, if we're gonna be talking about, you know what I mean, like talking about Kurdish women's right and image in front of the West, it has to be talked in a whole holistic way. Just having that poster on there, it does not serve except a fantasy that white colonizers or white white male fantasy that half of Kurdish women were supposed to be looking like. And and I think you know, on and on, I'm going to be keep talking about this topic because I feel the more that we're trying to like you know put that image on pedestal, 
it really puts a lot of Kurdish women under more danger in Rojava of accessing the right, of actually practicing the right feminism and what's like for them to, to, to grow up as, as girls and being women in, in Rojava. Um, I don't know if I, how much time I've taken, if I have enough time. Um, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll be, I'll be stopping at this point, but then I'll, I'll I'm happy to answer, uh, Q and A's, uh, at the end. Thank you so much, Ziva, for that very illuminating presentation. And looking forward to um, discussing these issues more when we get to the discussion part. And now we go to Maria Lab. Hello, Maria. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you for my amazing colleague who has been uh, speaking. Um, maybe uh, as mentioned by Razan at the beginning uh, or before, before we start, uh, uh, it's always hard uh, for, uh, for feminists to express themselves uh, um, um, within uh, a situation of backlash and uh, yeah, very hard backlash. Uh, today I'm on, I'm on moment of reflection myself. Uh, within the revolution, within what has started in 2011 uh, until now. So what I would like to do today is to share with you some of my reflections and uh, yeah, and more, I'm more open to a discussion than presenting um, uh, some, um, some thought. I will only be presenting some thought because I think it's a moment after nine years that we really need to think about all what happened. It has been mentioned by my colleague now, the sanctions and, the, and different aspects and the regime taking over most of Syria. So I think we need to look back and see what have worked, what haven't worked. And for me, when I think about um, 2011, it's um, the first thing that I remember, and uh, I think maybe I'm sure Razan was there, is the gathering uh, in the 16th of March, uh, 2011, uh, when families of uh, detainees, political detainees and the human rights defender uh, stand in front of the Ministry of uh, Interior uh, asking for the fate of their beloved one. And uh, half of them got arrested. Uh, so it was one of the spark of the revolution. And uh, what I want to stress here that uh, from 40%, 17 of them were women. And it is something that we always forgot to mention, uh, that women were there from the very beginning, especially uh, when the revolution was about uh, civil rights and was about uh, dignity and, uh, and the freedom. So after nine years, uh, few women uh, gathered last week in front of uh, Kapel's uh, court when the first trial uh, against the Syrian regime is happening uh, in Germany. So between 2011-2020, what, what happened, um, unfortunately, we are still asking for the same very basic rights. Uh, Unfortunately, the women who are gathering in front of Copelands today are uh, refugee or in exile. However, we still have a movement inside the country, and I'm sure all of you have heard uh, about what is happening in Sweden and how also women gathered to ask for the detainees. And in different areas of Syria, there are still a movement, uh, an important movement that we should continue continue to support. So, so coming back to Copelands and uh, the woman who gathered there, uh, what is the, what the difference between uh, the woman in 2011 and those women? Um, I think part of them are the same women. Part of them are now defining themselves as uh, advocate and the human rights and they are creating their own space while uh, before they were invited by activists and the human rights defenders today those women are taking the lead and are creating space to defend the right to justice the right to know the right 
the right to know about their beloved one, the right to know about their participation, about their role. So I would like here to mention a um, few moments who were at Copland's last week and that I will invite all of you to, to follow and to learn more about them, like Fadwa Mahmoud, uh, Maryam Halla, um, Wafa Mustafa, and other they those women are leading groups like families for freedom like caesar's family uh, and i think uh, they are representing a new a new way of woman participation uh, and formal one as i said that they are creating their own new space when we have been when we talk about woman participation most of the time we have been invited to join conferences invited but now they are again taking the lead in uh, in uh, in taking the space. Those women also are very different one from each other. So I think it's also something very important to mention. We have women from different generations. We have women from different ideology, but they are all here to uh, together uh, to to ask for justice. And it is something that really uh, struck me uh, uh, on women, as also we have seen, um, like I think more than uh, fifty women today creating the feminist political movement in Syria, also uh, based on uh, on on an agreement that we need more women on politics. So they are different in their ideology. They are different at different things, but they gather together. And I think it is something that Syrian women have been able to achieve that unfortunately I haven't seen really uh, on man participation who has been most of the time very ideologic. So, so I, I pay a lot of respect for all uh, the women who have been able to go um, against uh, all the ideology uh, around them and to stand uh, for justice uh, and for, uh, for, for their right. Uh, while I'm talking about uh, women's uh, groups, I mentioned some what we usually call victims group. But not only, as I said, I think they are uh, advocate and they are human rights defenders. I mentioned the few groups that are uh, working on detentions or torture, but they are also group forming uh, uh, from women um, who has been forcibly displaced and who are also learning about how to advocate further right, what is the legal argument. Uh, so I think also what those women are doing is they they keep learning and it is something very important and we need all to to reflect on it that uh, i have seen an amazing um uh, capacity of women uh, to learn and to build uh, and to build on, on their experience uh, as they are still looking uh, about the future and uh, uh, and facing all the different trauma uh, by an amazing uh, resilience. Uh, I have been working through women now with amazing women uh, um, in Lebanon, in Ghouta, who have been working in the worst conditions um, of, uh, of siege, of bombardment, of chemical, and then they have been displaced. And then again, they have been creating other women centers or having trying to serve their, uh, their society or their community. Um, and I think here again, it is a new way of resilience that I have learned uh, from uh, from this woman that uh, always keeping um, uh, looking uh, forward and building for the future as, um, as they are always, most of those women I'm talking about, I have worked with at least define themselves as um, maybe not as feminist. Uh, a lot of them define themselves as Muslim who are practicing their Islams, who are um, who are have their traditional role maybe as woman as wife. However, through their role, they have been able to. Uh, to understand a certain reality and to fight for it. Like a lot of them uh, also, I have learned from them how to define mi militarizations because I believe they have seen how much they are the first victim of it and how their children also 
uh, will be uh, the victims if they keep uh, being um, engaged in military action or if they don't have any way uh, forward. So uh, the learning of this woman is not coming from theory, I, I believe, it's coming from their from uh, from their life, from their uh, uh, experience of everyday living under war. And, um, and it is something that I have learned through the revolution and keep learning and sorry. Let's wait a, a minute and let Maria uh, um, think a bit about obviously something that's very, very upsetting for all of us and see if she'd like to come back before we move on. No, sorry, you know, here I'm, uh, I'm back. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think it is very something very important when we are theorizing everything to to also uh, learn from uh, the experience uh, um, uh, of those women. Another thing I have learned also that even though those women uh, define themselves as Muslim as practitioner, uh, very few of them, at least the one I have been working with, uh, will take an identity positions when it became to defend an armed group. Uh, as I said, maybe because they are the first victim of it, maybe because they are a very long uh, term perspective, because they are thinking about the children, because different reasons. But also I felt that those women are not taking uh, warrior uh, positions. It's not we need to take down the Syrian regime, whatever it costs is their position is more we need freedom and we need justice uh, so so yeah so from this uh, uh from this i have seen a lot of women group who are working on different issue and here also um i think it's important to understand the need of the woman to um not only work on political participations, as we have been suffering a lot from different trends uh, on Syria, but uh, also to work uh, on their own um, on their own priority. Uh, so a lot of women initiatives today are dealing with the economic situations, and I really believe as uh, as a diaspora we need to to support them on, on this because. Uh, um, Unfortunately, women, they will be the first one to pay the price of any economic collapse in Syria, and uh, most specifically the new generation of girls. And while I'm very much amazed of the work of women today, I'm very much afraid of the future of girls who, uh, who are now uh, growing up into uh, these very difficult situations of uh, being deprived of education, uh, under war, not having documentation and, uh, and other issues. So I will stop here for now and I'm happy to continue the discussion. Uh, Thank you so much, Maria. That was a very moving presentation and I totally agree with you about the need to have the unity of means and ends that the fighting an authoritarian regime, if you're, if you're claiming to be progressives and revolutionaries, demands a kind of behavior that's based on democracy, responsibility, accountability, respect. Um, so not, we can't just say everything goes by the wayside um, because the aims uh, justify the means. So, um, now I would like to ask a few questions from the panel before moving on to any uh, Facebook questions that we might have. And uh, uh, again, Facebook uh, viewers can, are welcome to submit their comments in the comments section of the Facebook post. And if you would like to address your question to any particular panelist, you can say that too. And if you'd like to identify who you are or where you are 
you you're welcome to do that you don't have to but you're welcome to do that so the first question i have for the panel is um, why were syrian arab progressives and leftist forces not fully supportive of women's rights and why were the Islamist uh, forces able to gain the upper hand within the uprising so fast? Can you repeat the question, Frida? Sorry. So the first question I have is why were the Syrian Arab uh, progressive and leftist forces not supportive of women's rights? And why were the Islamist forces able to gain the upper hand within the uprising so fast? Can you want to go first? <laughs> I think you know that I want to. I want to start. I don't know if anyone want to continue, but I would say, that, um, with the start of the revolution, it was it was obvious how where where who funded uh, and who supported and who pushed uh, certain groups uh, over the others. And yes, uh, there was this argument about that eighty percent of the population in Syria are Arab Sunni, which is like you know this argument was always used for the first years of two thousand eleven and twelve and thirteen, which actually really like. Mm, even kind of force the liberals or the you know like the, the secular movements to kind of like you know and then the, the you know kind of more of like younger generation secular movements to really follow that notion to actually apply democracy which it really took very far and like then and it was very obvious that everyone that is comes with the the um, more of that you know like you know like this the, the side of the the um the, the, you know, more people with the conservative Islamic values, uh, like, you know, the Muslim Brotherhoods, they have a lot of big support. They have a lot of big network that actually really contributed into really pushing those kind of, like, you know, work and, and, and civil uh, civil society wars and all of those things. So in my opinion, it is very much of a political game. Who was supporting who at the beginning? And sadly, the people who are working in, in, non, in, in non-violence and peaceful movements uh, peaceful demonstrations or peaceful change. These people were not uh, were not supported. Were not given the space, and they were actually, I think, in a lot of the the the, the agencies that really contributed um, that really really contributed into, into what happened, the destruction that happened in Syria. Whether if it's like the Russian or the, the the West or whatever that actually got into this, they did not want to support the liberal, the secular, because their values were non-violence where a lot of the other values like actually pushed against more of like, you know, like military move and, and fell into the agendas of like, you know, we need to take things by, by power or like, you know, and which, which in that time actually really rang a lot of bells because people were angry, people were frustrated, they, their, their loved ones are being killed, their, their, their family are being abducted and killed in prison and, 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 and tortured. So when you're talking about like, you know, a population that really taught, you know, like has that oppression within them, has that like sadness and grief that they don't know how to deal with, of course, things will go take in that direction more. Um, I just feel that the, the atmosphere, the, 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 uh, the more of like conservative atmosphere of people living in Syria, the fund that came from Islamic movements, uh, the the uh, the anger and the, the atrocities that the Syrian regime have um, have have done in Syria among uh, you know like you know also their proxies really you know of course it just changed the whole like and made people really just go more further into into anything that is military and you know those people who were like carrying the military actions were the Muslim uh, you know were more of the Islamic conservative values. I may add to Diva, I think what you have learned uh, from, from our experience that the fight for women's rights or even defending uh, women uh, fellows was never on the priority of uh, political of the men who are involved uh, in political issue in Syria. And a lot of uh, 
women political uh, um, activists or even experts uh, has faced uh horrible uh, campaigns and uh, yeah i believe their colleague never felt for them it is a priority to defend women rights and here we can feel how much women rights are not even are not really in their agenda when it became to 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 practicing uh the, the agenda Um, I just wanted to add to my colleagues um, something also um, is that, you know, I, I think we need to kind of ve be very clear about the idea that social movements are masculinist movements. So it's not like something where we're like kind of discovering this. It's, it's been repeated all over history. So th this is why I think that there is an urgent need to for this, like, this is why I think this, port in this panel is important. And I think there should be more discussions um and about this issue um and i can see the, the a lot of comments uh, uh on youtube and facebook they're kind of asking how can we can we solve this problem um and i do think that um um the there's a there's there's a so there are so many things that we can do to address this. And it's and I think it's, it's conversations. I think it's just creating safe spaces. I think it's creating to be and to be less um, kind of invested in internet because the internet, I think, which is a the, the alternative space that Syrians have today in exile. I'm talking about those who have been exiled. Um, the internet is the only space for them to to kind of express and sometimes organize. Um, and that space in itself needs to be reclaimed as feminist uh, because a lot of the backlash and a lot of the attacks have been happening in that space. Um, so this is this is something that uh, we need to talk about. What what does a what we there's a need to talk about feminist internet. It needs to, to be talk more clearly about um, uh, how does it what does it mean to to do solidarity work what does it mean to do feminist organizing on the everyday um, what does it mean to hold space for people uh, who have been silenced because of their views you know you don't have to agree with me you don't have to kind of you know uh, share the table or like share kind of uh, positions but I think what's the, what's the difference that this revolution or this uprising has offered to the table is that we don't want to be the same. We're not homogenous. We're not the same. And this is exactly what the Assad um, and the Syrian state is trying to tell us is that we're the same. And the part of the policing that they're doing and a part of the 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 that's the massacres and the and the and the uh, mass incarceration that the, the the Syrian state is doing is because they want people to be the same as them. Um, so I do think that the, the that what's important to say, uh, uh, and I, I want to thank my colleagues for kind of sharing this, is is to really to celebrate differences, is to really to celebrate positionalities. My experience as a grassroots organizer in Kaframbil telling you that militarization has been problematic to me should not negate other women who think differently. It should actually be very informative to how can we take this discussion further, how we can actually talk about different positionality, why is a person in this area is actually having uh, uh, this kind of problem, why other areas are not. So. This is why bullying and silencing and, and calling each each other acidists or white Syrian or bullying or there's a lot of a lot of terminologies that been been that we can be hearing like Kurdish people have been called um, uh, 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 separatists uh, or infisaliing um, people from a, from the conventional communities they've been called manitorian which is aqalawiyin so you have seen like a lot of a lot of the terminologies that we've seen is very much is about policing bullying is policing trying to uh, uh, corner people uh, uh, into uh, and discredit them and shame them is policing, which is very much tell us about the legacy of the Syrian state. And this is why I think it's important to kind of talk about beyond uh, uh, the binary of being Assadist and, 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 Assad and anti Assadist, because this kind of discussions are very important. What happens after Assad? What happens when Assadism leaves? Like, is this the kind of uh, uh, bullying that's going to continue? I mean, this is why the, the, the violence is reproduced, culture of violence and police are reproduced, and they go beyond sometimes. Uh, they, they are available, they are there in a revolutionary circle, so that's why I think we should talk about them beyond asceticism.
Thank you so much. Um, again, really amazing responses. And I'm learning so much from all of you. And I'm sure the audience is too. And I just want to clarify that when I talked about uh, leftists not um, supporting women's rights, I did not mean to ignore a, a small sector of of uh, leftist men who, who do very much support women's rights. And I mean, let's not, I don't want to forget that when Samira Khalil and uh, Razan Zaytuna were abducted, they were abducted with two men who were comrades who were supporting them. And they, we don't know about what happened to them either. Or uh, Omar Aziz, who was, um, was uh, one of the founders of the um, local coordinating committees, uh, an anarchist, um, who was uh, abducted and killed in prison, and others, and including men who, Syrian men who helped organize today's uh, panel. So I don't mean to ignore them. They're wonderful comrades. And thank you for your support and looking forward to continuing to working with you. This was a more general comment. So um, the next question is, um, uh, what efforts were made? The next, this is the next question for me. Uh, what efforts were made by Syrian Arab women revolutionaries during the uprising in 2011 to create bonds of solidarity with Kurdish women? Why did the Syrian Arab women's struggles become separated from Kurdish women's struggles in Rojava? Um, I mean, um, okay. I think you know, like if any, uh, you know, like you you can have this conversation before having a conversation about the what happened before two thousand eleven and the the, um, the the roots of racism that existed not only in the system, not only in the in the bas system, but also among the society and, and and the separation that existed. I think again, it goes when I talked about my experience being a Kurdish and what's like you know how to recognize your identity as a Kurdish person. Of course, it was like those two communities, there was a lot of separation between those two communities of what it's like being an Arab and what it's like to be a, a, a Kurdish person. And I think there was a lot of levels of uh, mistrust uh, or distrust between the Arabs and the Kurds after 2004 specifically, that was like, you know, what happened in Qamishlo and how the, the, the silence that happened among every community that was not a Kurdish community. And, you know, I mean, like a lot of communities said that, you know, we've heard about it. We've heard about a lot of things that happened occurs. You know, these we've heard those conversations after 2011 by Arab revolutionists who said that they did not know about those things, which I feel like, you know, I mean, personally, I find it kind of hard to, 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 to believe that, like, you know, we would, did not hear about what happened in 2004 and how they were treated. It was scary. As someone who was living there, as someone who was witnessing what was happening in Kurdish neighborhoods and Kurdish areas and Afrin and Qamishlo, I think, you know, taking that going in 2011 and when the, the, the regime was trying to, to kind of silence the Kurdish uprising uh, in Rojava and, and trying to control it somehow, um, and there was some sort of segregation that happened in terms of like, you know, like uh, organizing and all of that. <coughs> Um, uh, and it's like, so, uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I believe that like the two communities were further getting pushed again, far from each other. And that was like a very much a regime tool that, I, you know, was trying to, to, to capitalize on that. And the few people who were actually, you know, like, you know, like fighting against that was like, you know, one of the names of Michelle Tumo, where he was assassinated. Um, it was it was a lot of political games that got into it. It was a lot of like you know tactics that went into it to actually separate the communities. But let's talk about what the women, the Arab Syrian women, have offered to Kurdish Syrian women. I would say that there were no, but not because you know. I would say mainly because both sides of women, whether for Kurdish and Arabic, they are both disempowered. They're both working the shadows. They're both not supported, and. There um, and and um, I think you know to 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 talk about what a disempowered body can offer a disempowered body. It's you know I mean like it talks about what they're fighting against also that prevents them from from reaching to each other. Um, and and also um, a lot of those values of like you know that you know like that built on that 
Kurdish women are not good Muslims, especially in the times when the revolution was going more of an Islamic direction or like more of like a conservative direction. Like, you know, they were started using that in a, in a very much like a um, kind of, you know, like, like a good revolutionist Arab, uh, Syrian women should differentiate themselves, like, you know, like, and as a general, not talking about, like, you know, I'm talking about the general population, that they should separate themselves from the Kurdish women because it kind of represents the opposite of what they're fighting for. Um, and, and, and therefore, I would say it's, it's much more complicated by saying that, like, you know, it was only racism it, uh, or it was only that, you know, like, you know, like not willing to do that. It was so much to go into that. Um, and um, yeah, um, I don't know if, if I've answered the question, if there is another section of the question. Sorry, I was muted. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you so much. I also just need uh, to, to add of what uh, Ziva had expressed. Uh, so um, that um, for sure, we cannot discuss this before coming back to 2011 and all the very complicated layers that uh, that uh, Diva mentioned. However, sometimes we are the, we are facing some reality that today a woman in Idlib uh, cannot show her solidarity to a woman uh, in uh, in Qamish law uh, because of the uh, of the local. Uh, uh, statue of armed group uh, because she will fear for her life. Uh, and here I think it's very important what Razan started with about the role of women in exile. I think we have a very important role to to bridge uh, these gaps that are uh, happening today uh, because Syria today is so divided and even sometimes it's not about showing their solidarity, sometimes even the information doesn't pass from an area to, to another area. If every area is capped on a very dark reality and it's very difficult for them uh, sometimes to, to know or even to understand as a reality. So I think we have a lot of things to do as women in exile. Thank you. Um, I, I thank you. I mean, these are brilliant um, points that are made by my colleagues, and I, I think I, I, I don't have anything to add. I just wanted to go back, to, uh, Frida, to your earlier question, if that's okay. Just very briefly, uh, your comment about Zahran Alush and um, the these leaders um, that they have claimed to be part of the movement. Um, and I wanted to say something here that I, I really hope that some people who are listening to this can reflect on their positions of Zahran Alush. Zahran Alush, when he was killed in 2015 by Russian uh, uh, strikes, some people uh, who are Syrians and who are in diaspora, they have tweeted and they have said and they have wrote that, that Zahran Alush murder should be avenged. Um, and, I, and this is, makes me very sad because this comes after two years of, kidna of, of the kidnapping of, of Razan Zaytune, uh, Samira Khalil, uh, Nazim Hamadi, and Wa'il, uh, Wa'il Hamadi. So these, this is a very, like, this is why I always want to talk about the diaspora and the role in diaspora. And thank you, Maria, for, for saying that. Because unfortunately, uh, this is where the clash happens. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the things that I think, you know, there's one of the questions I think it was asked by Muna. What are the collaborations between anti-military feminism and uh, and grassroots? And, and I think this is an excellent point of, of, of to, to kind of illustrate this 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 point. Um, when Zahran Alush was killed, some of the women have actually said, you know, this is not a martyr. This person have jailed us. This person have besieged. This per this person has benefited from the besiegement of Al Ghuta. Um, so police kidnapped leaders. Uh, uh, and Razan Zaytuna, I think it's very important. Razan Zaytuna was against militarization, uh, but what she did is to kind of she adopted towards the new rea reality because she was living in a in a in a, in a FSA dominated um, uh, kind of uh, 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 like a you know. In the in the Ruta. So what Razan did is that she came up with a conduct, a code of conduct that the Arab, uh, that the FSA fighters would give in their arms, would to be trained on human rights violations. So she kind of adopted to this idea of okay, so 
this monetarization is happening anyway. So how can we deal with this? And this is the this is the what Zarasan did, and this is exactly how how uh, uh, one of the one of the pe one of the things that uh, uh, is is like um, uh, uh, one of the arguments why uh, uh, she was uh, or her work and other people's work in the Duma for uh, a group have been been threatening to people like Zahran Alush is this kind of human rights work that is trying to adapt to the new reality and trying to make a new reality. And again, this is the kind of life making feminism that a lot of these people have actually engaged with. So that's why, again, going back how to connect this to diaspora anti-military feminism is that when you have someone who is saying, um, let's continue Razan's work, let's support Razan's work, and this has been happening. Um, and, and you have someone else who's like, no, we should actually avenge Zahran, Zahran Alush. So this is the kind of, the, the, I would say a lot of the position, unfortunately, that's been counter-revolutionary position. People who have defended the uprising, people who have been defending um, uh, the rights of people, uh, uh, they have made mistakes by supporting people like Zahran Alush and misreading that 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 moment to be being avenged rather than actually to support people like Razan Zaytouni and others in Ghouta. Razan, since you were discussing this question, do you want to also? Just say a bit more about the Facebook question that just came up before I go to my next question. And um, uh, yes, do you see it on screen? Yeah, I think this is the question I was I was mentioning. Uh, is that the moment of of like Zahran Alush was killed? There was a kind of a, a different point perspectives of how people saw this. Some people saw it as a a moment to avenge him, uh, and some people thought that was a moment to kind of support um, uh, uh, the work of of, uh, of feminists that are on the ground. So this is the this is a kind of moment that I'm saying that. You know, we should we should uh, celebrate these uh, these interventions from anti-military uh, uh, feminism. Thank you so much. Um, I have one more uh, question comment, and uh, uh, unless there's a, a burning question from the Facebook audience, uh, yes, sir is our production manager. Yes, sir, do. You, is there is there a question an urgent question from the Facebook audience or may I ask one more question? Okay, I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, thank you. I will go ahead and ask my last question, which is uh, it's more a question and comment. So, as an Iranian socialist who's been deeply opposed to Iran's military and political intervention in Syria and its support for the Assad regime. I want to point out that at this moment, there are quite a few Iranian feminist activists inside Iran who strongly oppose Iran's military interventions and uh, who are suffering inside the prisons of the Islamic Republic. Women like Nasrin Sotudeh, Nargis Mohammadi, Atena Daemi, Golrukh Irai, Safide Qolian, some of whom have been in and out of prison, and others would clearly reach out to you in solidarity if they could. The December 2017 and November 2019 uprisings in Iran, which were both brutally repressed by the Iranian government, revealed that the majority of the Iranian masses are opposed to the regime and its military interventions. Even as we speak, various young protesters arrested by the Iranian government in November 2019 have been sentenced to death. And more and more Kurdish political prisoners are being executed. So uh, this is really more a comment. And the comment is that um, I just want the panelists to know that there are Iranian women feminists and women's rights activists who would reach out to you. It's just that so many of them are in prison or there's so much repression in Iran that they can't, they can't really reach out to you. But there are those of us abroad in, in the diaspora um, who, who are trying to reach out and have made some successful efforts uh, to show the other Iran. And, um, and I, just, I just wanted you, you to know that. I know you know that already, but I just wanted to say it more publicly in front of the Facebook audience. 
And, uh, and of course, we welcome questions from Iranian feminists who want to express their solidarity with the panelists today. So do we have uh, more questions from the Facebook audience now? Yes, it's on the screen. Um, shall I, sorry, shall I ask the Shirin's question? What were the discussions yes, about it? Yes, it to Razan. Yes, go ahead, please. Like in these mutual aid networks or about um, discussions about strategy in these, hmm, about the perception of the revolution, how it would progress. Um, so I can, for example, I can think of, um, uh, in 2011, I think um, I worked with several people. Uh, one of them is Razan Zaytune, and the other person, um, I was trying really hard to, to remember uh, uh, her name this morning. Um, uh, she works with the Syrian Women Network. She, uh, anyway, so what happened at that time in 2011 is, um, so the, the so the regime would used to is to, to 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 besiege the area first, right? And they would put snipe that they would put snipers around the area. Um, so, for example, um, a lot of the women in Daraya um, they have managed to come up with a system that is a mutual aid. Is that to kind of bring in all of these uh, the needs and the and the and the that a lot of people needed at the time, especially after the mass detention campaigns. Um, and the, 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 the purpose of these mutual aid groups is to kind of give, um, especially targeting people who have been, uh, their families have been detained and their families have been taken or killed um, by, the, by the regime forces. So these are specific mutual aid groups that, that either that the families of the detainees, the families of the martyrs, um, or the families of uh, of those who have been underground sometimes. So these are like, I'm talking about these, I was more kind of talking about these uh, in 2011 and 2012. Um, so yeah, I think these, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, perceptions of the revolution, they were also supported by by these women that I've mentioned, including Razan Zaytune, uh, uh, through the local coordination committee and other work. I hope I answered that question. Thank you so much. And uh, would anyone else like to uh, address that question? Oh, here's another question on the screen to Ziva. So I'm gonna go read the question. A question uh, in particular and all the panel, what do you think about the discourse of the, oh, sorry, it's like the, Traumatize the, the Arab veiled oppressed woman versus a Kurdish braided guerrilla uh, fighter reproduced internally under the regime as a Kurdish have always been. Yes. Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that really mm -hmm. goes to, uh, you know, like to the core of what I was having conversation about. Before we, we I, I want to just like, you know, go and answer the question. In, in my conversation about the woman fighter in Rojava, I'm not referring to the woman fighter and the guerrillas in the mountain in Kandil fighting. Because that's, I think, that's a confusion that happened for a lot of people. The people who were going into the mountain and fighting, uh, you know, like, an, you know, like, if we're going to talk about, like, you know, like, just objectively, these people are going and choosing to go through the mountain. They are there all in a one, in, in one purpose, in a one cause to be there and fight. When we're talking about, you know, when we're put, putting the, the image of women fighter in Rojava, we're actually simplifying the image of all women in Rojava. And I think, you know, like, yes, um, they've, I mean, the West have always been trying to do that, uh, to try to, to kind of like differentiate somehow and further kind of like, you know, you know, excuse or like, put, you know, excuse for what, how they're doing, what they're doing toward the Kurds versus how they're doing toward uh, the the non Kurds, which we all saw how Donald Trump have handled it at the end of it, and how the end of that support and allyship has ended. Yes, the the whole notion that we are more open minded 
have caused so much more silencing and more, much more dismissiveness for everyone who's fighting against the patriarchal and sexist values and the way of the very masculine and hormone fight activism that, that it's all over Syria. And it, a lot of my, my, you know, my colleagues have mentioned that, you know, since 2011, we've been repeating and repeating and repeating different versions and with more extreme versions of what a hormone, uh, you know, testosterone fight uh, activism look like. And I think even like, you know, feminist and feminist movement, in a lot of way they find themselves repeating that, which have always existed before, but even, you know, like the woman's voice only being heard when she's actually mimicking a, a, a man's voice and how they're acting their activism. So therefore I'm saying that this whole image of saying that what, what uh, how, I would say like, a, like this image of like drawn around Kurdish people and, and like, you know, it is more harmful for everyone who's trying to fight for the rights of Kurdish girls, you know, for, you know, I mean, like, or, for, you know, especially for LGBTQ rights, for example, for myself, because if I'm going to talk about, for example, queer rights, the first question that, you know, the first thing that they, they kind of slam in my face is like, you know, going back to 2017 and like, you know, the whole uh, thing that came out of like, you know, the queer Kurdish fighters. And I think, you know, like, it's it's the kind of the epitome of what what like you know like using using marginalized bodies and Rajapa as a propaganda tool, and and as equally as I think that how they they use us as a as a tool of pinkwashing, they are using you know I mean like you know women as a as a tool of pinkwashing to really kind of like cover up and not prioritize and and not consider that all the things that the feminists have been fighting for, the woman's right and the woman's voice and the queer theory and the, the feminist theory in ways of how to handle the revolution is all being silenced and put on the side, you know? Um, and I hope that answered the question. Thank you so much, Ziva. And would anyone else like to answer that question before we move on? No. Okay, uh, so a question from Maurice Hegarty. Would anyone like to comment on the impact of the new sanctions on women? And how can I connect directly with Syrian women's groups who are active within Syria? I want to ask, answer the second question, just a comment. And I think, you know, it was just also mentioned before that, and I wanted to, uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, in house when it comes to feminist movements, you know, like I've been in many, you know, many, many, I've been on, on many tables of feminist movements and like, you know, feminists, you know, like people who call themselves feminists, whether they are women or men or however like they identify. I think we're still, we're, we're, we're still have a lot of work to, to, to kind of like, you know, define ourselves as a feminist and have one definition of what a, what a feminist theory or queer theory, what it looks like in Syria. Because I think even within feminist movement, there's a lot of like, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not talking about like, you know, differences. Uh, I'm not talking about disagreement, but I'm talking about moral values and core moral values and how people are like, you know, like looking at the future of women inside of Syria, you know, like, we still have a lot of big differences. We still have a lot of like, you know, like um, we function still as proxies, as feminist movements, instead of having our um, own voice. And I feel for any outside body, they have to be really aware of that point if they choose to, rec to connect with any woman movement, um, to really be aware of that point that woman feminists and how, where their, 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 their movement look like and how their moral value look like. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not initiating an attack on any feminist movement. I'm just saying that we are weak as a movement, and for everyone who's going to be connecting us, we have to be aware of that point. Thank you so much. And oh, did uh, did the, did anyone, did Maria or anyone else, did you want to answer the the second part of the question about connecting to women inside Syria and how people can connect before we go on to the next question? Okay, yeah, actually, I will comment on uh, both questions and a little bit uh, on a previous question. Um, so, so yeah, so I think um, 
uh, one way of connecting, and actually I was discussing with Joe before uh, before uh, this um, uh, this amazing panel, is to invite today, as we are uh, doing a lot of our panels online, is to have more women from inside Syria. Sometimes we will need translation, but I think we really need to together our forces and to use this opportunity to uh, to make them more visible when they want to. And uh, so, so yeah. So actually, one uh, one op one opportunity that raised from the pandemic of uh, COVID nineteen was this uh, transformation into this uh, online. Uh, discussion and i think the voice of women inside syria is missing and we need to to work on it uh to to get them uh, uh more uh in in these discussions uh on the sanction point um i think it's still very hard uh now to to evaluate the impact of sanction however uh i think uh sanctions with economic collapse uh with uh with the pandemic we started already uh, to see the rise of uh, of violence against women uh we have in um uh we have seen clearly uh, that the women were very much uh, the first to be uh, affected by the economic situation uh, by losing uh, their uh, their work, as uh, most of them inside Syria, uh, both men and women uh, actually are working on in uh, informal economy, uh, so they have no protection. No, uh, they don't have any way of protection. And women were more vulnerable. Uh, they are um, working uh, most of the time on uh, very. Um, um, I'd say informal, and they are very new to this uh, working environment uh, as they have been um, obliged to to start uh, working after losing uh, the main breadwinner um, so so yeah so we need to focus on this for sure and we need uh, to gather more data about uh, the impact and the interaction of the different conditions uh, uh, on Syrian women Yeah, and I want to actually I wanted to um, comment also on Diala uh, Diala question. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, because I wanted to do this pre uh, previously. So, so yeah, I I totally agree. Uh, uh, Diala fund army group. There is there is so many way to that the revolution has been harmed. Uh, however, I think that we have from within a lot of problems that we need to face and to uh, and to work on. Uh, but I would like also, as I as I said about the pandemic, to for us as women to focus on what we um, what we can build on it. Uh, the pandemic is very bad, but now we can use we can use it to uh, the condition that has been created by the pandemic to get uh, to get more women. Yes, funding and trend of funding has been very harmful. The energization of the women movement uh, have affected badly uh, the feminist movement. However, I believe and I have seen uh, a lot of Syrian women organization who have been standing against fund uh, trend and uh, who have been using their NGOs to support women initiative inside Syria and to have been gathering power together like just two weeks ago um, a campaign has been launched by different women organization to support victims or uh, of sexual and gender-based violence in Syria so I think what we have learned as women as feminists as most of the time conditions are against us, but we need to be smart and to use what we can use to, to yeah, to create our own opportunities. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to, um, if that's okay, to comment on the sanctions um, question. Please. 
So um, I think it's important to, and I agree totally with Maria, uh, I think this is very important to stress that uh, people in here they should be centered in the conversation and that um, um, there's a very early to uh, uh, like assess or measure the impact of recent sanctions um, because they're just, they're, they're recent and it's, and it's a kind of, a, it needs time to, to see how they affected. But I actually want to go back to this, like go beyond this, this kind of practical kind of answer to that question and go more into the rhetorical kind of um, like uh, uh, the logic of, of sanctions and how does it work specifically in light of, um, of the, of the, of the, of the Caesar Act. So basically the Caesar Act tells you that they don't want to topple the regime. They actually tell you they want to punish the regime. And they actually specifically kind of use the word victory. So they wanted to kind of, the, those who have been actually um, uh, uh, designed this, uh, this sanctions is actually telling you that this is to kind of address the victory that this is to kind of address the victory side of the of the of the the announcement of the victory of the of the regime. So interestingly enough, it's actually telling you this is not to double the regime, and it actually tells you to to be punishing the regime, and they actually arguing that this is not going to harm civilians and you have other people who say they will have the they will ha harm the civilians and you have other people saying that uh we should not forget about uh, uh assad is actually starting to uh, uh that is the, the main reasons of why we're having economical crisis in syria and i think this is true you know this is very true that is assad is the syrian state that is to blame uh uh, uh by the the war the war methods that have been uh, uh, launched against the uprising, the economical economical war. Um, so this is this is something that we're not really uh, arguing against that, but we are arguing against these strategies and these foreign policies when they tell us that they're actually going to be emancipatory when they're actually they're not. They are telling us they are not going to uh, help the the uh, or the kind of a. Uh, and I and I do kind of want to say that how can sanctions be liberatory or emancipatory? This is a, a conversation I think I'm not sure uh, uh, we agree on because we have seen sanctions in Iraq and elsewhere. So so I do think that you know these this is an important question of to use like how can actually sanctions impact women and others? But I think with this recent one specifically, I think that there's a lot we can talk about without just assessing the impact directly because the logic itself and the way that's been designed and the rhetoric in it itself is, I think it's a very uh, worth, uh, is an area to, to, to critique it, I think. Thank you so much. Are there other questions from Facebook? And if not, I have uh, one more point to make, but let's see if there are any more questions from Facebook. From Bana Al Adbana. Uh, could you write the name of the Iranian feminist in prison for speaking out against the Iranian support uh, for the. Uh, uh, okay, before we go to that next question. So, the women inside, the uh, women's rights activists inside Iran, Iran's prisons, they've been issuing uh, uh, letters. And I don't think that any of them have specifically mentioned Syria because they they can't inside prison. But from the context of the letters and statements they've issued, it's very clear that they, they are opposed to Iran's military interventions in the region. And they're opposed to Iran's military state period and nuclear missile programs. So, uh, so I can I'd be happy to type the names of the uh, Iranian women political prisoners. Some of the, some of them in the post section in the comment section of the post after the program. Right now I can't do it because I'm moderating, but I'd be happy to do that after the program. And you can always go to the website of the Alliance of Men of Socialists as well or contact us. Next question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir, would you please go go back one step? How can people outside Iran support these women? Uh, we have a campaign in solidarity with Iranian women political prisoners. And uh, we're currently we're involved in a global prison abolitionist uh, um, 
uh, coalition. Uh, so if you contact the Alliance of Men of Socialists, we'd be happy to uh, respond and, 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 and talk further about how you can help. Can you really oppose the Islamists as a woman feminist inside area in, in Syria? Is it possible? That's for the whole panel to answer. Yeah, I think you know, maybe formally it has been very difficult, but they have we have seen women who have been gathering or demonstrating uh, against uh, armed group. Uh, and uh, yeah, but informally they, you know, through even continuing their work on women mm -hmm. empowerment or on women rights, uh, they have continued to, to oppose it uh, to the, uh, through this armed group and to different power uh, who have been opposing to women rights and we have a lot of experience uh, of women who have been like, standing for their rights yeah thank you Ziva Razan would you like to answer that question or shall we go to the next one yeah, Ziva, would you like to say something about this? I say go for it because, like, you know, um, again, I'm like, even if I say something, I mean, I'm the complete alien of a lot of movements, you know, I mean, like, with the least amount of allies. So I was thinking, you know, like, let Rosanna answer. Yeah, I mean, I think, as Maria said, um, there has been, there are still, I mean, um, people who have uh, um, women and they're still working until this moment, um, trying to continue their work um, and despite these, um, these pressures that are very much true and every day. Um, and it's important to remember that there, when we're talking about is it possible to to oppose? I mean, it, it, we always think that there's a very confrontational kind of um, like positions, which is actually they're not. You know, they're very much look like, it, like how it was the case with uh, with the Syrian state. Like they're very much censored. They're very much on the high. They're very much um, in hiding and invisible. And I think that's why um, we think that that a lot of people, not just women, but also a lot of people have been um, resisting. And, um, you know, when you talk about resistance, I, I really am very careful to, to use that word because there's always limitations about that resistance, right? Especially when you're talking about it, like enormous, enormous pressures and very changing realities, impossible realities to live. So, um, of course, there, of course, people like, like Maria said, the, by just living, by just being, is 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 a challenge to these powers, um, and this is something actually is a very important opportunity for me to to go back to one of the main points that were discussed in this panel, is that to support grassroots women's work. There are a lot of women, for example, like Mari, uh, 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 I was going to say Raya uh, Rahal Mazaya Center. They are still working. Uh, until today, and they have been after being, and a lot of the a lot of the other women as well. But this is I'm, I'm just I'm just mentioning someone I'm, I'm in contact with. I mean, a lot of people as well um, have been have been displaced um, in the recent uh, attacks on Idlib, and now they have moved their work elsewhere, and they have lost everything. So now they they more than ever they need a support, especially in a very challenging uh, 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 setting with the, with the COVID. Thank you so much. And what else?
Um, I'm, I just can answer this question that is on the screen. Um, I mean, uh, it's interesting, you know, like, you know, because we had this conversation, me and Razan, like very frequently about how to take care of ourselves, take, take care of ourselves. Um, you know, like, and, and, and I think it's from one form of our taking ourselves, we're connecting with, with, with each other and, uh, you know, but I think, um, It is, I mean, depends, depends on, 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 on your participation and where you belong and who you're working with. It does also impact about your, the way that you cope with the morning. And uh, I think for me personally, let's say, and I don't know if President agrees with me, um, we, we, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of difference in, in the way that like, you know, we, we, we see feminists, we see, we mourn and, and, we receive kind of, I don't know like how to say that, I'm just like now escaping my mind, but I would, I would say like, it's, it's for me, it's, it's, it's quite a lonely journey to be honest, because um, it's, it's isolating to be working as a, as a feminist who is, you know, a lot of your, the, the fellow feminists and the movements are defined as TERFs, you know, like who is still like have a lot of, values that actually considers you know like your existence and your body and your identity is unvalid um so it does make it for me specifically it makes it very confusing for me very that like you know i feel the need to mourn about the loss of a lot of syrian feminists or the syrian revolution in general at the same time where these people um a lot of the community they consider me as a forbidden body um and for me to keep assuring myself that humanitarian beliefs and system is, is not separated and like you cannot uh, segregate human rights could get challenging sometimes when you're facing a lot of that uh, alienation from the community. That's a beautiful question. That's a beautiful answer, uh, and also a beautiful question. Um, I'm gonna reply brief, uh, reply briefly. Also, wanna uh, maybe uh, answer a few questions like very quickly. Um, just to say, Zaina, your your question. We talked about it early um, about like what is a feminist policy and how we envision envision poli feminist politics earlier in the uh, in the webinar. Um, so uh, uh, we also talked about that connection between. Um, uh, feminist politics and what do we mean by by revolutionary and and we talked uh, about uh, several points about I personally talked about grassroots um, uh, feminism and 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 how that is actually uh, connecting uh, between the revolution and and the uh, or the uprising with the with the feminist politics. Um, so uh, I, I also wanted to reply to Vanna very briefly, which is uh, to be honest, what made me through my healing um, is feminist. Um, they're feminists, just like Ziva was saying. Um, I am very blessed with amazing friends, uh, very amazing people um, that are very, um, that some of them are before the uprising, some of them I've met during the uprising, and today they are my support system. And I think that's an important reminder to do is that we need time to care for ourselves, to love ourselves, to forgive ourselves, um, to learn, to reflect, to apologize, um to hold space for each other um and i and i've learned all of that you know um and also reflect on privilege you know as maria said that we are there we are accessing this webinar from our locations in exile slash diaspora and and um and, and that that's that comes with a lot of responsibility um and and this is something to remember um in our feminism um and also healing um, I think that the, the one the question of, from Fatima Masjidi that I, I I think about right now is 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 two things I'm thinking about right now. I don't know. I, this is something to think about, and I think a lot of the questions I like to think about them. I'm not very good at answering questions without thinking, so this is why I find Q and A very challenging for me. But what I can think of right now is um, like sectarianism, right? I mean. Sectarianism got really, really worse after the uprising. And I think 
you will you would also hear the same from um, um, feminists in Lebanon when they tell us that feminism was on the rise after the the civil war. So this is the same with Syria. Uh, feminism is worse after um, uh, after the war, and I think this is something to work on. Uh, I'm, in, I'm I'm like is is about sectarianism. How we can tell our communities that our problem is is our states, um, not people, not religion, not um, uh, conventional communities, and I think this is this is something that you know progressive and and socialists and feminists can do um, on this on this, and also uh, with the with in terms of of incarceration and policing states, you know, and military states. I think this is also an area that a lot of people that we share as well. Um, so there's a there's a a lot of areas of of solidarity, but of course. Uh, going back to Bana's uh, question is is really healing, right? I mean, I think we before we start organizing and we start is to give ourselves a moment to to really reflect and heal because there's a lot of anger that can get trapped and that would turn into a lot of toxic energy that would destroy our movements. Um, and I think this is the legacy of Black feminists who tell us to kind of rest and to take care of ourselves before. Um, before continuing the fight. Thank you. Um, I wanna, um, I wanna say that uh, before I just on, on, on before, yeah, I just wanted to go to Zena's point. Uh, just quickly say that one comment. Um, I think you know, like we need to, for, you know, for most and for all, we say that, like, um, uh, so I was gonna say that, like, I'm gonna like, as a feminist movement, we need to kind of also consider ourselves that we are part of the movement that we've done a lot of mistakes and we continue to do a lot of mistakes, and. Just because we are, um, we have a more holistic uh, theory in terms of how social justice should be implemented, that does not mean we have a lot to learn and a lot of uh, problematic matters to unpack and relearn. And um, I mean, just, you know, like, I think, you know, like how, I think, I mean, for, I think, you know, mostly for someone who's also being considered. For example, for a lot of feminists who look at the poly, at the way that the pot is happening in terms of like you know misogynistic or sexist or patriarchal views, and someone also who's considered completely outside of feminists by a lot of feminists. So I think you know like there's a lot of opportunity to be inclusive. There's a lot of opportunity to to start really accept the critic critiques and not consider ourselves like uh, away from mistakes. Yes. We're all revolutionists. Yes, we've all given given a lot of sacrifices. Yes, we've all given a lot, but that doesn't mean that we're we um, we can't do mistakes, you know, and we can't uh, have an opportunity to learn from those mistakes from others who have been impacted by our mistakes. Um, I just want to say that the last I don't know was there a question before like, you know like, we can uh, end I don't know. Okay, um, could you speak to organizing an exile for feminist politics as you negotiate between different modes of protest mass movement? Uh, oh my God. I think we've, we've, we've talked about it also, like, you know, what is our responsibility as activists in exile and how we, uh, what we're supposed to, how we're supposed to take that privilege of being outside and the connections we have outside. And, um, but it is, it is, you know, to be honest, I mean, I'm an exile, but, you know, like, there's a difference, difference should be also, like, you know, be made between the people who are in exile and people in diaspora because. Uh, a lot of organizations working in diaspora have had a different approach when it comes to the Syrian revolution. They were more in an emotional, emotional approach and more of a romantic approach, while the people who have been living at, getting, and like you know, living in exile right now have more of like a practical approach of what we should be doing. And I think, you know, 
you can't do any movement without reading the context, without you know implementing it. We all uh, have the same idealism and the same uh, you know I mean like ideal situation we want to live in. But at the end of uh, the day, we're living in a reality, uh, uh, and we we and and we need to read the reality very well. Um, and I don't know if that's like really like you know can answer the question or if it was like a clear answer to the question. But I think um, a lot of work that you know, for example, this panel and a lot of other works that can actually bring the voices from those who have like lived the experience, different from the different from the the, the people who like you know been in diaspora before, and different from the voices who are inside of Syria. And uh, you know, like in all of those three voices should be read within their context and provide the, the, the support based on that. Uh, at the end of the day, whoever wants to see it, to support the Syrian should communicate with the Syrian. And um, yeah, I think, I think uh, I hope, uh, I hope that really, you know, somehow gave some answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you all. I just want to say that Maria Abde had to leave, unfortunately, uh, because um, we we had uh, originally thought that the panel would end at 1.30 and we went about a half hour over. Um, so I would like to conclude by saying that uh, today's panel and the webinar series on Syria, as well as webinars organized by the Alliance of uh, Middle Eastern and North African Socialists are both aimed at educating raising awareness and creating a basis for progressive and forward-moving practice. Within the uh, MENA region, we have been creating bonds of solidarity between Syrian, Iranian, Iraqi, Lebanese, Turkish, Palestinian, and Kurdish socialist activists. We also, and, 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 and Egyptian socialist activists, we also stand with the magnificent, as well as, of course, um, I, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to mention all the names, Sudanese and Algerians. So, so I'll go over them again. Syrian, Iranian, Iraqi, Lebanese, Turkish, Palestinian, Kurdish, Sudanese, Algerian, Egyptian. And if I missed any, I apologize. So we've been trying to create bonds of solidarity between socialists from all these uh, various countries. We also stand with the magnificent U.S. Black Lives Matter uprising, which is inspiring the world and hope that it can lead to new connections aimed at revolutionary social transformation around the world. Today's panel and the whole serial webinar series also reveal that even when we do have uprisings, the internal contradictions of any movement continue to come to the fore and need to be addressed and overcome if we are to move forward in a progressive and revolutionary direction. We cannot overcome these internal contradictions, however, without a vision of an alternative to capitalism, racism, sexism, and heterosexism. So toward those aims, we hope that those of you who have viewed today's webinar, take what you have learned and do something with it. Write a short report about it for your blog or website publicize the cases of Syrian uh, political prisoners. Uh, talk about these webinars with your friends at the next demonstration that you attend. View the next webinar and invite others to view the rest of the series. The next webinar in the series will be on Wednesday, July 8. It is entitled From Black Lives Matter to Palestine and Syria. The panelists will be Huri Peterson Smith and ba uh, bana qadbian maryam barghuti and shirin akram boshar the moderator will be robert coffee it will be sponsored by the global campaign uh, and by solidarity a social feminist organization and the us campaign for palestinian rights you can find a link to it on the facebook page of the global campaign of solidarity with the syrian revolution and i believe the image of the poster is now on the screen then on Monday, July 6th, you are also invited to a book launch for Yasser Monif's new book, The Syrian Revolution Between the Politics of Life and the Geopolitics of Death. It will be a dialogue between Yasser Monif and Sara Dehkordi, who is an Iranian socialist feminist and political scientist. 
we have now, uh, and of course, uh, I believe the poster for that is also on the screen at the moment. We have now reached the end of our program. I would like to thank our panelists, Maria Alapte, Ziva Gorani, uh, Gorani and Ra Razan Ghazawi. I would like to thank Yasser Monif, Joseph Zahir, the Global Campaign of Solidarity with the Syrian Revolution and the Alliance of Men of Socialists for organizing, sponsoring, and producing today's event. If you have questions or would like to help, please write to the Alliance of Men of Socialists at info at alliance of me, me socialist, plural, uh, or contact the Global Campaign of Solidarity with the Syrian Revolution on Facebook. Thank you and goodbye.